Happy New Year's everyone! I hope your roles this last year have been blessed so far, and that you're ready for one hell of a year in FGO. A new year means new historical figures, so today we are going to be continuing our tradition of ranking the top 10 historical figures that will be showing up in FGO NA in the year of our Lord Taiga 2023. I would like to take a moment to remind you all that this is not a gameplay list. This is entirely subjective based on who I think is the most historically interesting. At the end I'll also throw in who I plan to roll for, and there will be timestamps for all of this. Anyway, let's get started. So 2023 on NA is the year of the fairy, because Lost Belt 6 is going to take up a huge chunk of it. That said, I wasn't really able to bring myself to put any of the three big fey knights on this list because they're somewhat obscure. However, we are not without fairies here because our number 10 spot is Oberon. Oberon is a fairy king originating in France in the 13th century, but is mostly known for his appearance in Shakespeare's A Midsummer's Night's Dream where he and his wife Titania bicker about child custody, causing the weather to turn violent because they are both so powerful. Oberon in the play is the child of Morgan Le Fay and Julius Caesar, and much like his father, is incredibly intelligent and utilizes trickery to his advantage to eventually secure custody of the child. Much of Oberon's role in the story is to act as a deity that controls the environment, putting the forest to sleep, manipulating others, and causing people to fall in love with one another. However, by the end of the tale, he seems to regret his actions and reverses much of them with magic, awakening all in the forest as though they had just been in a Midsummer's Night dream. Oberon himself is a very unique addition to the game and I look forward to seeing him in his role in the Lost Belt. By the time that this video is up, this character is already in NA, but number 9 is Senji Muramasa. Ignoring his vessel for the time being, Muramasa was one of the most prolific swordsmiths in Japanese history. While originally a smith for the Tokugawa, his swords eventually gained a reputation for being cursed items and became a symbol of anti-Tokugawa feelings. Despite being such a prominent smith, none of his surviving works are designated as national treasures in Japan, which is somewhat unusual, but he does have one labeled as an important artwork. The reason why Muramasa is so interesting is because he himself is shrouded in an air of mystery. We know that there was a real person who founded a school of bladesmithing under the name Muramasa, and we have some of his blades still intact today. It is believed that he was a student under the equally famous Masamune, though this is likely untrue given their timelines. Muramasa's blades were among the favorites of the Tokugawa because of their extreme sharpness, specifically the Mikawa samurai, who served Tokugawa Ieyasu. However, legend holds that samurai who would use his blades would be met with great misfortune and this did seem to happen time and time again. Despite this, during their original time, the blades were revered for being supreme weapons. It was only later down the line when people began associating the blades with anti-Tokugawa feelings. The belief eventually arose that Muramasa himself was a curse bringer who wished to see the fall of the Tokugawa. This really has no basis in reality, and it's likely that Muramasa just saw the Tokugawa's powerful and profitable customers. However, with so little known about him, that's more or less lost to history. In number 8, we have Mori Ranmaru. Ranmaru is a rare instance in fate where the gender bend may actually be justified. Ranmaru, as he is described in history, was a beautiful young boy of great intellect. He had been in the service of Nobunaga pretty much since childhood, which was his whole life because he died at the age of 16 or 17. He was described as being incredibly loyal to his master and talented in the ways of swordsmanship. Also, he is often described as a lover to Nobunaga. His major role in history was being one of the people present during the Honoji incident, and is said to have stayed with his master inside the burning temple to prevent Mitsuhide's forces from claiming Nobu's corpse. He is remembered in history as a symbol of loyalty among the people of Japan, and I look forward to seeing what madness has been born from the Servant Verse rendition that a fate writer came up with in a nightmare. Number 7 is a classic bait and switch in the hero Dobrynya. If you want the full version of the legend, check out this video up here where I cover him. Here is the Spark Notes version for you though. Dobrynya is a legendary character from Russian folklore, known for his slaying of the dragon Zeme Gornyich. Dobrynya's story begins with him ignoring the advice of his mother and as a result is attacked by a dragon. Dobrynya managed to defeat the dragon by using a Greek hat and the pair agreed to leave each other alone if the dragon went away and didn't bother anyone else. The dragon agreed, flew off and kidnapped the princess, immediately breaking the agreement. Dobrynya was then made to go save the princess or else he would be put to death, and he fought the dragon for three days at the Saracen Mountains. He wanted to give up until a voice from heaven told him to keep going, and he won the battle three hours later. After having saved the princess, he took her back to Kiev, but because he was a peasant, Dobrynya was not permitted to marry her, so instead he went off and married a hot half-giant girl, which is honestly the better side of the deal. Dobrynya is famous for being a powerful but very human character in myth. His tales are a joy to read and his connections to real-life historical figures like Vladimir I is very interesting. In FGO, he gets kind of written off for being a bland cat girl nonsensical gender bend, but believe me when I say that there's much more depth here than meets the eye. 
Number six is the hottest member of the round table, Percival. Percival comes to us from the Arthurian legend and his big claim to fame is being the original person to bring back the Holy Grail. He is one of the original members of the round table and one of the members who we see the full life and training of. Originally, Percival was born to a secluded widow, but when he meets a group of knights, he decides to join them and becomes a member of Arthur's court. Here, he is bullied by Sir Kay, which makes Percival leave on new adventures to prove Sir Kay wrong. On this adventure, he meets two of his uncles who train him to be a better man at arms and point him towards the direction of the castle of the Fisher King. Here, he sees a severed head on a plate and a bleeding lance. He then encounters nine witches and his future wife. He later finds out that the head was his cousin's who was killed by the witches, and so he goes and kills them all in vengeance. When he returns, he is celebrated as a hero. Later, he embarks on the quest for the Holy Grail and manages to return with it, being hailed as a hero once again. However, this would later be retconned by Thomas Mallory, who had a major hard-on for Lancelot and replaced Percival with Galahad. That said, Percival would continue to be a member of the Grail quest and one of the three knights to actually return successfully with it. In this version, he also heals the Fisher King. Percival is a great character and I'm looking forward to his appearance in Fate Lost Einyar. Sticking with the Arthurian tone, we have Morgan Le Fay. I've also done a dedicated video on Morgan that's almost 20 minutes long, so if you're really interested in that, go check that out now. In brief, Morgan was originally a fairy queen who lived on the island of Avalon, but is more famous for her role as Arthur's half-sister and as the active antagonist against him. Morgan is indirectly responsible for the death of Arthur by stealing and disposing of the scabbard of Excalibur, which made Arthur impervious to attacks. Morgan, in her most famous appearance, was originally a pupil under Merlin's tutelage, but promptly left him after rejecting Merlin's advances. Morgan is often used as a writing device in the later legends as a stand-in villain who either curses a knight only to be defeated, or acting as a continual thorn in the side of the Knights of the Round. Perhaps one of the things that she is most famous for is that she is the one who revealed to the knights Mordred, Gawain, and Gareth Lancelot's affair with Guinevere, which would begin sowing the seeds of distrust in the knights and preluding to the great disaster to come. Despite this villainous appearance, she does also have a soft spot for her family, appearing to have disdain for Arthur and Arthur alone. As such, she is sometimes seen assisting Knights of the Round on some of her appearances. Her portrayal, as it appears in Fate, is handled in a unique way, so I look forward to seeing how it applies to her lore. In number 4 we have Zenobia. Again, I have a full breakdown video on her here, so check that out. Zenobia was a brilliant queen who was born in what is likely the most unfortunate circumstances possible for her. Her kingdom was bordering the Roman Empire and was technically a part of it, save for a treaty that gave the former ruler independence. Zenobia herself was well educated and viewed as a wise leader of her people. Upon learning that her empire, and by extension her people, were in danger of the Romans, eventually coming back and claiming all of them for themselves, she took up the arms of war and began securing a better position. She fought tooth and nail and successfully claimed strategic territory, but was eventually snuffed out by the superior numbers and technology of the Roman Empire. Zenobia herself would be captured and paraded through the Roman streets in chains of gold and would die soon after. She, to me, is fascinating, because had she been born at a different time, she may have been remembered for being a conqueror herself, but that's just speculation on a possible history. In number 3, we have Izumo no Okuni. The oft-forgotten quick caster, Izumo is an amazing figure in history. She was not a warrior, but rather a shrine maiden. She came to notice that many people were not visiting shrines at the time, and so she set out to come up with a way to garner more attention. Thus, she created a style of dance that would become famous all over the world, Kabuki. Originally, she danced alone and was seen as being a little bit too provocative, so she recruited more people to dance with her. These tended to be the lower members of society, like prostitutes and the homeless. And so she taught them how to dance, sing, and perform. She also eventually trained them to tell stories through the seductive dancing, and over time it evolved into a proper theater form alongside no theater. This new form was widely criticized initially for being too provocative and was then banned, but not before her creation of the play Nagoya Sanzaburo, in which Okuni would bring back her lover from the dead to be with her through the power of dance, which would be incredibly popular during her time. Okuni would later vanish in 1610 and her life after that is somewhat unknown. Her impact on Japanese theater is still felt today, and the images of Kabuki characters are some of the most iconic and recognizable images images of Japan. Number 2 is Tai Gong Wong. Tai is comparable to Merlin in his role of being an incredibly powerful kingmaker in history. Tai had worked as an advisor for the Shang Dynasty for 20 years before King Zhao of Shang became the leader. King Zhao is the one who would bring Daiji into the Imperial Folds, and as a result would rule as a tyrant to appease her. Tai wanted no part of this and feigned madness to get out of the court life to go fish for the rest of his days. Life would not remain peaceful for him though, as he would be approached and recruited to work for King Wen. During their first meeting, they created the Six Secret Teachings and King Wen married Tai's daughter. Thus, Tai entered his service. After King Wen died, his song King Wu decided to conquer the Shang, which Tai advised against for the time being, claiming that they needed to be more patient. Soon, they learned that those who lived under King Zhao were too scared to speak and thus launched an attack on them. They were incredibly successful, and King Zhao burned the palace down and Daiji supposedly died with him. We all know that she actually was Tamama no Mai, who would later flee to Japan. 
Ty is very interesting in history for being the right man at the right time every single time, and he also seems like a cool fishing partner. Finally, for number one, we have none other than the Lord of Debauchery, Jacques de Molay. I love Malay in history for being the most insane and depraved person possible for the time and being the most on the nose example of absolute power corrupting absolutely. Malay was born into a minor noble family and made a knight at the age of 21. He would soon enter in the Knights Templar and through his charisma and achievements would be promoted to the role of Grand Master. Before his crimes were revealed, he was seen as a wise leader of the Templar and was believed to be holding up the righteous values of the order. He had several successful campaigns against Syria and defending against the Golden Horde of the Mongols. However, after a fight of succession with King Henry II and, a heavy, and heavy pressure for the Templars to merge with other military forces, the thought process that the Templars may be hiding something began to grow. Malay continued to oppose a merger even after a new pope was assigned, claiming that separate smaller militaries was much more strategic. This would eventually come to a head with royalty and religious figures demanding a merger and eventually witnesses to Templar rituals would come forward. It was revealed that Malay and the Order had been performing sacrilegious acts behind the scenes and lining their own pockets for their own benefit. This would eventually lead to the arrest of many of the knights, Malay being burned at the stake, and the order being dissolved. This isn't even getting into the old god that's inside of De Malay, which only makes them more interesting. But that's enough of that for now. Those are who I believe are the top 10 most interesting historical figures that are coming out this year, but while I love history, I also love gotcha. So in three words or less, here are my targets for 2023. Goat Mom, Boneless Swords, Seahorse, Fox Fisherman, Goth Not Mommy, Mighty Morphin Dragoon, Mothman, Smother Me, Headpats, Head pats aggressively. And that's it for that. Thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. Best of luck to you guys this new year. Let's make it a good one. Check out my links down below for my Discord, Twitch, and Twitter. This is the year I'm going to attempt to hit Twitch partner. So if you'd like to come and follow the Twitch, maybe catch one if you can, I would greatly appreciate it. But for now, guys, keep your chin up. Peace.